as a child, I participated in Civil War reenactments. I was a bit too young to really understand what it was truly representing. A time when the country was literally divided, with brothers taking up arms against each other, their beliefs split on a humanitarian issue that many of us look at today and wonder how it ever existed, the slavery of fellow human beings. While the end of the war was decisive and signaled a change in the direction of the entire nation, it was one criminal act against a U.S. president that would not only threaten the freedom of black Americans and the peaceful coexistence of a nation, but also cause an impact that wound up costing even more lives. It was April 9, 1865, when General Lee surrendered the forces of the Confederacy to the Union Army in Appomattox, Virginia. The newly re-elected and war-hardened President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, could begin to breathe more easily, but there was still much work ahead. The country needed to be pieced back together and rebuilt. The Reconstruction era had begun, and there was little time for celebration. The most that President Lincoln would let himself enjoy was an evening at Ford's Theater with his wife, Mary Todd, to see the play Our American Cousin on April 14th. Famed actor and Confederate spy John Wilkes Booth, who was becoming increasingly angry about the state of the country, particularly after the fall of the Confederacy, used his knowledge of Ford's Theater and several local relationships with sympathizers to carry out the assassination of President Lincoln. During the performance, he entered the president's booth and used a Derringer pistol to take his life. Booth then leapt to the stage, by some accounts even giving a very short speech, and then fled through a stage door to a waiting horse. The man who had just killed the president was on the run. Very soon, a $100,000 reward was offered for information leading to the arrest of Booth. That would be worth nearly $2 million today. In that gunshot, Lincoln's plans for reunifying the country were forever altered, and several other events were also set into motion. The plans for the reunification of the country were formed well before the Confederacy's defeat, beginning in December of 1863, while the war was still raging on. Lincoln outlined a plan which called for 10% of Southern voters, a privilege kept to white males at the time, to sign loyalty agreements and for the Southern states to recognize the freedom of all slaves by ratifying the 13th Amendment. To members of Congress, this was seen as too lenient, and stronger measures, one in particular known as the Wade Davis Reconstruction Bill, were passed by Congress. Part of that bill included punishment for the Southern people, who were regarded as traitors by the bill's proponents, Senator Benjamin Wade of Ohio and Maryland Representative Henry Winter Davis. President Lincoln vetoed the bill, which he thought was too vindictive. It would have undermined his efforts and would have alienated many well-meaning Southern politicians. Lincoln wanted only the highest ranking civil and military officials serving the Confederacy to face any charges of treason and felt that the Southern states did not need to be scrutinized before any readmission of their states to the Senate or House of Representatives. John Wilkes Booth, had initially rode into Southern Maryland, an area with limited communication via telegraphs and plenty of Confederate sympathizers. He and a man named David Harold continued on to a tavern nine miles outside of Washington where they had a cache of weapons and equipment. At some point, Booth had injured his leg. Some say it was from that jump from the booth that the president was in down to the stage, but that's debated. Other historians note that the doctor who tended to that injury was told by Booth that it happened when his horse suffered a fall. In the days after the assassination, the country was in mourning. There was a line over a mile long to view the president in his casket. But while that was happening, there were also federal troops on a manhunt for John Wilkes Booth. With the assassination of President Lincoln, the press also had Booth in their crosshairs. Outside of referring to him as a devil and a madman, there were plenty of photos of Booth to go around due to his popularity as an actor. It's almost as if the ego of Booth was becoming his downfall. Even his jump to the stage suggested that he not only wanted to assassinate the president, he wanted to be known forever as the person that did it. 
Lincoln's plans for reunification were slipping as the congressional calls for punishment upon the Southern states intensified. To many of those that had voted for the Wade Davis bill, Booth's deed proved their argument that Confederates from their lowest ranks to the very top should be considered traitors. Former Vice and then Acting President Andrew Johnson, however, had supported Lincoln's views somewhat, particularly in that the country was reunified with the demise of the Confederate government. However, he expanded far beyond Lincoln's idea of leniency. Johnson declared amnesty to Confederate soldiers or public officials who own less than $20,000 worth of property, the equivalent of $377,000 today. Additionally, anyone above and beyond that amount or station could petition President Johnson for a pardon. During his presidency, Johnson would grant pardons to 13,000 Southern applicants, and perhaps most shockingly, he also pardoned the former president of the Confederacy himself, Jefferson Davis. I'm not sure that that's a step that Lincoln would have exactly endorsed. Booth was convinced that he needed to cross the Potomac to get into Virginia. He hid out in the woods, but was keeping updated on the search for him via newspapers that were being brought to him. Apparently, he was surprised at the tone of the articles, thinking that he would have more support. Even some former members of the Confederacy thought that his actions were damaging and disgraceful. On the night of April 21st, Booth and Harold tried to cross the Potomac, but navigated incorrectly. They wound up still in Maryland and stayed at a farmhouse of a Confederate sympathizer. Meanwhile, Lincoln's body was loaded onto a train for a 13-day journey to his final resting place, with millions of people coming out to the tracks in seven states to witness the president's final journey. Like Lincoln, President Johnson stated that he would require the southern states to ratify the 13th Amendment, which declared slavery illegal with constitutional finality. However, Johnson was in a hurry to set the country right and decided to leave the southern states with the control to restore their governments with almost no changes in their policies or officials, a step that Lincoln certainly would not have endorsed. Mississippi failed to ratify the 13th Amendment and, even more egregiously, they passed what were called Black Codes, a series of laws that singled out people of color, outlawing their ability to rent or buy property, bear arms, or participate in gatherings after dark. Other southern states joined this effort and created their own versions of these codes, which included granting whites the right to arrest blacks whom they'd observed committing a crime or, even in their opinions, acted strangely in public. So, arrested, a black male could be convicted of an act that had been deemed criminal by a white person then sent into a prisoner auction, where the convict would then be assigned to a plantation to work off the sentence through labor. In effect, this replaced one form of slavery with another. By April 24th, John Wilkes Booth had finally made it into Virginia, though he was clearly beginning to understand that he wasn't being seen as the nation's hero like he had expected. He was taken to a farm where a family lived in what was sort of a world of their own, Mail delivery had been stopped during the war, and this family didn't even know about the president's assassination. They were told that Booth was actually a wounded soldier named James W. Boyd. Realizing that the Confederacy had truly fallen, and with an insane reward for his capture being out there, Booth decided that he needed to flee the country, and he began planning to head to Mexico. But all of that would come to an end on the morning of April 26th, when the law caught up with him. Booth and David Harold were staying in that family's tobacco farm when the soldiers arrived. Harold surrendered, but Booth decided not to, telling the soldiers he preferred to come out and fight. He didn't come out, however, even when that barn was set ablaze. Despite having orders to take him alive, a sergeant shot Booth. He would later say that Booth aimed a gun at him first. John Wilkes Booth was pulled from the burning barn, still alive, However, with a gunshot wound to his neck, he would die three hours later. But the impact of his actions at Ford's Theater would continue to ripple across the nation. President Johnson kept turning a blind eye to the 13th Amendment being ignored. And despite the fact that the southern states had not done their part to be readmitted to the Union, 
In December of 1865, Johnson declared that the Union had been restored. However, the Republicans in Congress refused to seat those Southern representatives and senators. Johnson retaliated by refusing to sign any bills into law. That same month, the 13th Amendment was ratified by a majority of the states. On the surface, Johnson's actions seem like he's getting the job done. However, he still had no intention to do anything about the Black Codes or stop any other efforts to perform end runs around the 13th Amendment. It's said that he saw the freeing of Blacks as a threat to poor white families who he thought would need to compete with the freedmen for labor. Representative Thaddeus Stevens, a Republican from Pennsylvania, led a small group of other House representatives who, before the Civil War had even started, were staunch abolitionists. Andrew Johnson and Confederate sympathizers called this group the Radical Republicans. On March 3, 1865, the Radical Republicans wrote the Freedmen Bureau Act, which provided management over lands confiscated by the Union Army during the war, created schools in these impoverished areas, and set out to integrate the approximately 4 million former slaves into society and help protect them from black codes. Johnson vetoed this bill, something I once again doubt that President Lincoln would have done. But the immense hatred by most members of Congress gathered enough support to override Johnson's veto. The Freedmen Bureau Act was scheduled to come to an end after one year of action, but its continuation and powers were expanded in the Freedmen Bureau Act of 1866. Two months later, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was passed, granting citizenship to all people born in the United States regardless of race. Well, with one notable exception, the indigenous tribes were not included. Johnson again vetoed the measure, but Congress would overturn it. To protect this act from being struck down by the Supreme Court of the United States, Congress moved quickly to write the 14th Amendment. This constitutionally cemented the citizenship of black Americans who had been born in the United States. However, this rapid and sweeping reform caused some heavy backlash. In May of 1866, rioters in Memphis, Tennessee killed 46 black men, many of which were Civil War veterans who fought for the Union. More than 70 others were injured. Dozens of homes were burnt to the ground, along with some schools and churches. Memphis police officers and firemen were among the offenders, taking part in the hanging of freedmen and the torching of their homes. Sadly, no one was brought to justice for these horrific acts. Following this, in July, New Orleans suffered a race riot as well. Veterans of the defeated Confederate armies attacked freedmen, killing about 50 and wounding scores of others. Many of these were, again, veterans of the Union Army. These acts of hatred and savagery threatened to ignite other riots and further fueled the need for change in America. The Reconstruction Act of 1867 was passed into law on March 2nd, which ordered the southern states to be divided into five districts, which were then to be controlled by martial law. Adherence and ratification of the 14th Amendment was mandated as well. And finally, one by one, the rebelling states accepted these changes, reforming their state governments. They were granted their places in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. The succession was finally, just as President Abraham Lincoln had wished, effectively annulled and the country reuniting, thankfully, with some protections for our newly recognized and newly freed citizens. Fortunately, the presidency of Andrew Johnson was largely a failure, at least in terms of him driving policy. If he had received full support from Congress, it's a certainty that slavery in one form or another would have continued in those southern states, an impact that would be truly criminal. But had President Lincoln not been assassinated, one has to wonder if the nation's support for him his ability to handle highly pressurized situations, and his ability to articulate and demonstrate the effectiveness of his logic would have seen that reunification go more peacefully. Would the Southern race riots have occurred? Would those lives have been lost? Would the Reconstruction Act of 1867 have even been necessary? How exactly would things be different today? had an actor not tried to grab the attention of the world stage by prioritizing his beliefs over the outcome of a war 
one that involved and divided us all.